All right, so we are like uh, 10 minutes before time. So people are going to start coming in. Yeah. Usually what happens is uh, many people start watching it uh, in their own time. So after the, you know, the live is over. So that's how we yep. That's how we yep. see it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the that's beauty and that's the benefit of yeah. uh, having the recording up on YouTube for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think today is going to be very, very, you know, new for our audience and it's something that will be, I guess, extremely useful uh, because very rarely would, can we bring somebody who has kind of almost carved a new, a new direction altogether, you know, a, a new field altogether. So that's something that uh, I guess uh, would be a big inspiration for for, for a lot of people, you know, who would be watching this. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, I never expected myself to be in this place. <laughs> so yeah. that way, yeah, it's surprising for me as well. I, I never expected this would happen. <laughs> right, right. So hi everyone, if people are joining in, just say hi and hello to each other. Uh, we would love to know from where you are, uh, what's your research area, uh, which university you are from, uh, and uh, what, what exactly you are working on right now. Hi, hi, Lena. How are you? So Lena is one of our like, uh, yeah, she is from Philippines, but she is currently uh, doing her research studies and also teaching in India. So, oh, I see. Yeah, and uh, she says Jai Shiv Sankar to us. So Jai Shiv Sankar, Lena. And uh, so Lena works in education uh, field. I guess if, if I'm correct, I think that's what she works on. Then there is Vidya. Hello, Vidya. How are you doing? Vidya is from Pune. And Vidya works in education of technology as far as I remember. So these are like people who keep, you know, who are like our regulars. Good. People say hi and hello to each other. We have a very, very, very special guest today, all of you. And we'll have some lovely time with Ganesh. So let us wait for a little, bit, little bit to, to have a little more people come in and then I will introduce Ganesh and then we'll start the chit chat. So today, the, the discussion topic, you know, it, it, it might seem to be interesting, right? From astronomy to gastronomy. So we have to talk about that. The, the, the crux of today's discussion is that when you have new directions or when you want to go and plunge into a new research area and you have so many new ideas, but at the same time, you are not so sure whether you should be leaving what you are currently doing and, you know, 
entering in your whole new territory. So we are going to discuss all that with Ganesh today because Ganesh has done something which is just crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and we are going to get some inspiration from Ganesh to, uh, you know, and also we discuss all the hurdles, all the difficulties that uh, would automatically come up when you are trying to explore something very new, when you are trying to establish something very new, not just explore. And what were the challenges that Ganesh faced? And we are going to discuss all those things, you know, and how you can possibly also come up with something like what Ganesh did. Just say hi and hello. I see people coming in. Uh, your name, what you are working on, and your affiliation, your university, your country. Just for people who want to know more about Ganesh very quickly, I'll just give you his Wikipedia link. Ganesh, is that okay if I give you uh, give them your Wikipedia link? I think that's fine. Okay, all right. So here you go. Other people who have just joined us, just say hi, hello, who you are, what you're working on, and so on, right? I see some people are shy. That's not good. Okay, all right. So I think uh, in another one minute, we will, we will start. Yeah, Ganesh is always exciting. So, okay. Oh, okay. So let me see if I can make all the participants visible. So I think I have to do it in gallery mode. Okay. All right. I think now both, all, all of you can see both of us. I think that was one issue. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not good, very good in, uh, uh, in Zoom. Uh, we have Jagriti, Jagriti Chatterjee saying hi, hello to Ganesh. I know Jagriti, she worked with me for oh, a while. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, Jagriti, then school. you should say hi to me. Uh, and, and you should tell us, uh, all of us, what you're working on uh, and uh, where are you from? Yeah, hello, Jagriti. Would love the community, the the, tea, the entire club would love, it's kind of like a club, Jagriti. So the club would love to know what you're working on. And we are very warm welcome to the club. Hello, Umesh. Hi, Umesh is also kind of very newly regular. Okay, you're from West Bengal, person PhD in computational chemistry in collaboration with China and Australia. What's, which university? Triple IT Delhi?
Okay, so I guess we will start and we will let people keep coming in. So, uh, uh, and a very, very warm welcome to, to Ganesh to be with us today and to give us the time. Uh, it's our pleasure to have Ganesh be in, in Saturdays with Suresh. And Ganesh has been a very close friend of mine for a long period of time and uh, we have keep, uh, kept in touch, uh, you know, when he was for a, for a short time, when he was in, in my university in, in Gandhinagar and then later on when he moved to IIIT Delhi in, in Delhi, uh, one of the top premier universe, tech universities in India. And over there also, we had a lot of deep conversations of all sorts and I used to go there, uh, you know, thanks to COVID, I cannot go there anymore right now. But yeah, so Ganesh, uh, his background is in uh, uh, computational uh, system, system biology, right? Ganesh, if that would be the, the term to use and computational biology, uh, yeah. uh, I would say. Right, with complex, which deals with a lot of complex networks, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, pathway analysis and computational models of pathway analysis, right? So and protein binding and all those sort of things. I guess, yeah, just correct me Ganesh if I'm getting it, uh, getting it wrong. So, and yeah. so, and before that Ganesh had a different background, uh, you know, when he was doing his uh, PhD and then when he, he, you know, came in and he started his own independent research lab. And then now what Ganesh is doing, I'm not going to spill the beans over here because I would love Ganesh to talk about that himself. Because something that Ganesh, Ganesh has essentially established a whole new area, research area. You can say that. So that's how special today's guest is. And uh, what I would love to do, Ganesh, is just to you know tell us a little bit about your journey, just in brief. You know how you, you know what were the layovers? You know what, the layovers that you did. You know starting from your student days uh, because we will have a lot of students who would be watching this video so starting from your student days and how you transited from one layover to the other layover and finally you have opened up this whole new research area sure sure thank you Saurish. first of all it's a pleasure uh, to be with you on this saturday evening and to be talking about my journey of uh, science and uh, to tell you uh, the, uh, a little bit of elaboration on why this topic uh, or the title Astronomy to Gastronomy uh, that says it all yeah. that uh, it's a journey uh, of last 20 odd years. As a teenager, I was always aspiring to be an astronomer. My, my uh, dream was to be under the uh, dark sky and maybe using a telescope or a radio telescope or a visible telescope watching the stars making observations uh, and learning about the, you know, the depth of the universe. That's what I always intended to do. So astronomy and astrophysics was always on my mind. Uh, but then uh, from there, it has been a very tipsy turvy journey. I have taken a very curve, uh, journey, which is very uh, uh, unusual uh, at the same time, uh, uh, at the same time, exceptional, uh, I would say, uh, which has made me reach to a place where, as you write, as you said, uh, people do recognize me to be uh, having established the foundations of a new niche uh, uh, called computational gastronomy. And I did not expect myself to be doing this at all. <laughs> uh, even six to seven years down the line, when I look back at uh, in the historical uh, context, I did not expect this to be happening as such. So that's a broad uh, overview of what uh, the title is meant to be uh, like this. The, from astronomy to gastronomy. I, have, I was trained as a physicist to begin with, BSc physics, masters in physics, followed by MTech in computational techniques, which obviously uh, uh, dovetailed into computer science and applications of computer science for physics pro based problems. That's what I primarily worked on. Uh, but then I made a transition. I moved despite having a, a what we call a national level examination, CSIR, JRF, junior research fellowship given by Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in India, 
uh, in physics i moved into a biology institution a completely outright biology institution called center for cellular and molecular biology and that opened me a completely new dimensions i must say and from there uh, to very briefly tell and i would come back to this if it is needed uh, i have moved worked on protein structures modeling protein structures as graphs uh, brain networks in one of my postdocs in national center for biological sciences uh, then back to protein structures in max planck institute of molecular genetics in berlin uh, returned to india to start a new lab and start my studies in understanding complex diseases using graph theoretical paradigm which is what you mentioned about looking at pathways and looking at protein protein interactions etc and uh, food happened <laughs> gastronomy happened uh, uh, and all of this happened uh, serendipitously uh, and i when i look back i have done a bit of analysis of how these things might have happened right so i will tell about that also when i when yeah. we get into the advice part of it about how possibly one might uh, train oneself to be lucky you know i i happen to be lucky i must say that but at the same time this luck has come at the cost of uh, or at, at uh, because of certain way of behaving certain way of planning my research has helped me uh, and possibly it might help others as well so i will talk about that when we come to that mm -hmm. right right so so going back to your journey a little bit like moving from physics to biology that itself is a big step isn't that so especially when you are a, you know you are just a you know a, a, a young student right so uh what what was the inspiration behind that like going into biology right so uh i was in physics and then i had done uh, this computational techniques thing and you would be uh, you know Uh, surprised to know that the primary reason i wanted to do my mtech in computational techniques was to get a job <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> which i uh, which despite uh, the y2k uh, which is the year in which i was doing completing my degree uh, all the computer uh, organizations were shutting their shops hmm. uh, and in those times i did get one job in a company called computer solutions and software international in hyderabad okay. uh, i got a job Uh, and you would be surprised uh, again to know that i had this fellowship and i didn't know whether to go for a phd that to in a biology institution where i possibly might get selected uh, or may not be selected for that matter uh, so the excitement uh, was in terms of what a physicist can offer to a biology uh, or, or biological question all right so i could see uh, the new human genome was just sequenced Uh, right and there was a lot of excitement and even physicists were talking a lot about these sequences the dna sequences analysis of dna sequences application of fourier transform wavelet transforms on these sequences such were the questions which were being talked about even in physics department although rarely not so frequently i mean it would be very shyly being sp spoken because people would be considered outcast if you were to be talking such things Uh, right uh, so uh, out of that small excite i and i am uh, i have been i have this streak of being adventurous uh, yes. getting into domains uh, which <laughs> that i know for sure <laughs> yeah so this adventurous streak is what uh, pushed me into thinking that possibly my training as a physicist and a computer scientist might be valuable if i were to work in a biology lab Uh, although it was an adventure because on day one despite me being selected post interviews i was warned that in case i fail in grad school i'll be repeat kicked out <laughs> of okay. the uh, of the institution that is the language which was used to me, uh, to all of us for that matter but i was told that you know that is what can happen and there was a careful glance a deliberate glance at me <laughs> given an outlier because out of yeah. 17 odd people who were selected i was the only physicist and probably i was the first ever physicist joining a biology institution called ccmb so uh, that is to answer your question that why and what made me move into biology uh, starting from physics and computer science so do you think that your uh, your training uh, your physics training, especially your physics uh, training as a physicist in terms of modeling uh you know phenomena 
and also your training as you know in the computational when you were doing computational modeling so that itself is al already a weapon so to say when you entered into system biology uh, was that in your mind or you just discovered that when you went into that area that oh yeah i have actually gotten some good you know strong weapons which many people don't even have it uh, i had already seen this phenomena that my seniors from physics department who had been trained in different aspect of physics yeah. such as condensed matter physics uh, uh, and similar areas they were easily migrating to computer science just to give an illustration so what i could see is that analytical ability is something which is uh, something which is imparted as a rigorous training in a good physics department or in a good, good masters in physics uh, degree right. in any good degree right uh, i might not have thought at that point of time in such a detail but it was at the back of my mind that uh, whatever i have learned can be of value i can be out of the box uh, you, know, uh, you know when it when it comes to moving into a biology institution everybody else for example was doing molecular biology right. uh, genetics uh, fly lab, uh, you know genetics with uh, fly mouse etc and here i was uh, sitting with my phd supervisor who herself was a physicist incidentally uh, and ecologist uh, by training in her phd right and uh, uh, working on a problem uh, designing a problem rather uh, which uh, looks at application of computer science computing and physics into a question of biological origin so to me that was pretty exciting premise uh, right right but, yeah i i would assume that yeah so so tell me tell us something about like uh, you know uh, you, you you were kind of establishing your your career into systems biology and uh, you, you you were also having uh, you went to max planck first of all i mean that you know tell, tell us a little bit about that experience like when you went to max planck and you know you were in berlin you you know what, what was that experience what did what was the key takeaway so to say when you went there correct so uh, first of all uh, one unfortunate fact that we need to realize about uh, post doctoral fellowships is this that a post doctoral fellowship done in the context of india i'm telling this this could be applicable to other countries some of the other countries as well which are which are beyond europe and america mm -hmm. uh, and maybe some other advanced countries is that uh, if you were to do a post doc from india it is not valued as much as it is valued if you were to do probably similar kind of work from outside india right so one of the key advice that i was given is that ganesh despite all your good uh, you know good intentions and good work that you may end up doing uh, you will be counted in terms of number of years spent outside india given the fact that you have done phd in india so don't waste too much time only say being in india despite the fact that you are at one of the best, best places national center for biological sciences is apart from ccmb is another premier research institution in molecular and cellular and similar biology life sciences in general uh, in india so this was an advice with which i went to max planck and that was that was a wonderful experience for me although being a very short experience uh, unlike many other postdocs which uh, who end up doing yeah. a postdoctoral fellowship for at least 2 to 3 years if not a little more longer than that so i always intended to be back uh, to be in india trust me uh, i never uh, expected myself to be spending a very long time outside india whether it is america or europe for that matter but i must tell you that i fell in love with berlin uh, yeah so uh, the institute was fantastic the resources were uh, the experience in terms of talking and dealing with uh, people from different origin altogether like right. jewish people right Uh, was also fantastic in terms of learning their cultural practices how do they do research because remember right. certain certain research practices are also influenced by the culture right. in which you live under Absolutely. right Absolutely. so that makes a huge difference in terms of learning some good practices from them as well beyond what i might have learned in ccmb and ncps so it was a fantastic experience and it was a wonderful exposure to the world beyond india to me uh so i spent a year there before returning to india uh and it was uh, this experience has served me 
well uh, in my later life even when i am trying to mentor my own phd students as they move outside india uh, for their postdoctoral uh, fellowship right. Right? one of them right. one of them being vandana who was your previous yeah. panel right. uh, uh, member right yes. so yeah. so it yes. has helped a lot that way yeah so uh, so tell me uh, you know you were always uh, adventurous right i mean you know even as a kid you were adventurous but that super adventure being into you know we will come to comp- what computational gastronomy is but being you know getting to that next level you know of, of being super adventurous would it be uh, do you think that some of that would be your exposure when you were in berlin to all through different schools of thought or something or maybe or how how did it just happen that you just got to, to that level you know so i'll put it this way partly it is in my nature as i said in terms of moving uh, you know we taking risks to an extent i would say right for example moving from ccmb to ncbs uh, and changing my phd topic altogether uh, from my phd topic which was modeling protein structures to moving into computational neuroscience was a adventurous uh, game in the first place uh, many people advised me not to do that they said that computational neuro- neuroscience first of all is a very competitive uh, domain there are very too many people working there so you won't be able to make a mark that was the comment which was given to me to make a mark you need to uh, stand apart from the crowd right so, so you won't be able to do that was uh, what was told to me but let me tell you i believe that beyond there are two factors one is my personal attributes themselves in terms of how i deal with life and how i take this but at the same time being in ccmb ccmb is one of the most unique experiments in indian science i must tell you uh, pushpamitra bhargava professor pushpamitra bhargava uh, is the person who created the idea of ccmb which i believe luckily has been carried forward even after he left the institution and the kind of exposure that i got it in got in ccmb was amazing it was by the way a phd in equivalent to doing in europe uh, in terms of talking to each other at a equivalent level to the other scientists including my mentor now we we used to call each other by name no sir madam business right we used to uh, participate kind yeah kind of very unheard of in the in the indian culture it does doesn't happen it doesn't happen in india we are uh, you know uh, we have a system in place which is hierarchical in a big way right, right? so uh, we do talk to our mentors as sir or madam right which is not which was never the case in ccmb and i believe it is even not the case even today right so that uh, exposure to lots of domains uh, of biology uh, and being a computational biologist i was i was considered to be uh, you know having lots of time at my hand remember all of these molecular biologists who are having this small uh, timer which is uh, put in their pockets or on their belts uh, and they are always watching that because their pcr is running polymerase yeah. chain reaction is running and uh, they have to go you know in time so that the dna doesn't run out of the gel right so those are the kind of uh, people who are very busy and time bound whereas somebody like me who had the leisure of all the time i would sit in the canteen and would read papers or would would go and attend lectures from some nobel laureate or somebody else who is coming from a different domain altogether i believe these roughly 4 to 4 and a half years that i spent in ccmb were extremely amazing for me in fact even my adventure of computational neuroscience uh, happened because my supervisor and ccmb allowed me that environment where i could explore so exploration uh, luckily i would say had i been in a place where uh, i had been given this imposition that look boy you are supposed to finish your phd in four years or whatever five years uh, so make it fast ensure that you are on your job all the time blah 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 probably i wouldn't ha- wouldn't have been the kind of a researcher that i am today so i am indebted to my experience in ccmb and culture of ccmb and uh, if ccmb people are listening to this which they would if hopefully at some point of time they should try keep uh this culture uh, up and running mm-hmm. and and tell us a little bit now about computational gastronomy because i'm pretty much sure everybody is excited to to know what that is yeah. right uh so computational gastronomy is a data science which blends food with data 
and the power of computation for achieving data driven food innovation now that's a mouthful of a definition but essentially what does it do well food is an artistic endeavor it is never considered uh, to be scientific right today for example if i were to talk about the science of food most of the people would scoff off the chefs yeah. and uh, amateur uh, cooks and food lovers in general they would consider it to be an artistic endeavor right right but in a manner uh, today progress is happening at a level where possibly we might end up writing an artificial artificially intelligent algorithm ai algorithm which might regenerate a shakespearean text which might regenerate the music of ar rahman to an extent i call it ai rahman artificial intelligent rahman uh, the famous musician from india south india yeah, yeah. in a similar manner my dream is that possibly computational gastronomy will take us in a direction where we should be able to generate new recipes predict taste you know and make recipes healthier tastier right that's the kind of a purview you know layman's parlance what computational gastronomy is expected to achieve so computational gastronomy is about using the power of data and computation for understanding and uh, transforming food that's what it is all about right so so people who are food lovers you should definitely go and check out ganesh's uh, website and i'm pretty sure you will get to know more about with some of his even some of his recent uh, publications you should definitely uh, go and check them out if not publications uh, there are a lot of uh, popular articles right ganesh uh, yeah. you can check that out as a as a beginner as a starter uh, to understand this a little bit more uh, regarding the data when we are talking about data ganesh I mean, what kind of at what level or what granularity of data uh, we are talking about good question so uh, it started all at a very coarse grained level i must say that i call it spherical cow it's a joke on mathematicians and physicists uh, that if you are asked to model a cow uh, a mathematician or a physicist would end up uh, starting by saying that let's assume that the cow is spherical right so in a similar manner uh, a physicist in me has started by looking at cuisine and recipes uh in a very spherical cow manner in a very simplistic manner right I, and i must tell you that food is a very complex topic the right it touches culture it touches it touches anthropology art uh apart from gastronomy right and other topics of life which are of social relevance let's not forget that as well right uh even women li- women's liberty is at- attached with uh, food to a big extent for that matter Oh, really, I will, I will come to that. You know. That. Yeah. So, uh, given that this is a complex topic, we have to start somewhere. So, what gra- granularity of the data that we are we started off in 2013 and 14 was very very uh, simple. That we said a recipe is nothing but an unordered list of ingredients. Now that's rubbish. I know that, right? That sounds rubbish. uh and an ingredient is nothing but a bunch of clever molecules so for example you can take any particular recipe uh you know chicken tikka kebab uh, for example where you have chicken you have chili you have tomato for example and uh, by, by the way sorry have... all the vegetarians over here sorry <laughs> for the we can talk about paneer paneer uh, palak paneer if you wish uh, okay. which is spinach uh, added uh, to the paneer uh, for that matter right doesn't matter you can take any recipe that you wish uh, recipe is nothing but a bunch of ingredients right and in- ingredient is nothing but a bunch of flavor molecules that is the gra- granularity at which we started off with to do a first ever investigation of indian cuisine for the food pairing phenomena uh, which basically is asking a question about given that there are so many ingredients say for example thousand ingredients why is it that only certain recipes are, have been achieved culturally speaking why not others if you ask yeah, that question yeah yeah are there rules are there formulae are there patterns uh, in which the recipes have got logged into food pairing is an answer to that question given by a chef called heston blumenthal from uk he said that indeed yes uh, that seems to be true uh, 
ingredients that are similar in taste in terms of their flavor composition tend to go well with each other that was the proposition that heston blumenthal made and in 2011 for the first ever time it was investigated for world cuisine many of the world cuisine the north american latin american southern and eastern european cuisine primarily and was shown that indeed heston blumenthal was right what we showed in 2015 uh, uh, study which was eventually published in 2015 uh, was that indian recipes at least the recipes that we had investigated from tarla dalal uh, uh, there is a famous chef called tarla dalal her website yeah uh, those recipes tend to have a contrasting blend of ingredients and importantly which was more important result in uh, which is what we have reconfirmed over a period of time is that not only the fact that there is a contrasting blend of ingredients which seems to be one of the defining feature of indian recipes pri- primarily speaking but importantly the placement of spices i repeat not the quantity but the placement of spices which spice goes into which recipe seems to be rather critical in defining the nature of food pairing the food pairing that happens there i have not quantified the food pairing for you right now here because for the paucity of uh, yeah. you know time uh, but it is just a measure of flavor molecules average number of flavor molecules that go into a recipe common shared flavor molecules that go into a recipe that's what it is but we our observation that spices are critical for or they are we called it as a fulcrum molecular fulcrum of indian recipes that's what we called it uh, based on the food pairing experiment measurement that w- that was done was one of the key observation that was done starting with a cold grained uh, analysis so we started with the question that you asked about what is the level of granularity that we are looking into so we started at that level and without uh, and i would come back to this uh, once again if need be but to today we are at a level where we have extended that far beyond the cow is no more spherical it has got a uh, little more enriched details in terms of recipe not being bunch of ingredients but sequence of ingredient quantity what unit goes into it what processing is applied on it is it fried sorted etc those are being accounted for we have accounted for that and have created a new database which has recently been accepted for publication called recipe db right so uh, yes. we have improved on so granularity uh, in summary if you want to check out recipe db uh, that's it let me ganesh if you can just give me the uh, link the link on the chat sure I, i shall i shall just a moment yeah i'll just add it in the chat box hmm. okay thank you ganesh yeah, yeah yeah please continue right so the granularity has improved over time in the last 6 uh, to 7 years the data has become richer granularity has improved spherical cow is no more spherical and uh, chefs are more happy with the kind of analysis that we are doing uh and importantly i also realized that this is an industrially important topic so that is another uh, serendipitous uh, observation that i ended up doing i have been a theoretician for a lo- for a long period of my life i have been looking at only theory aspect of uh, science whether it is physics or computation for that matter right uh, all of a sudden i realized that there are applications uh, of the work that uh, we are doing here so uh, companies have got in, uh, interested in using our research for developing new products so which i won't get into much detail unless you ask right, me right. Uh, more about it but, but yes what, we are, what we categories are doing... what categories of companies these are oh yeah okay yeah. so these are uh, uh, fast moving consumer goods companies uh, these are international fmcg companies that are and food and beverages companies Uh, who need to use or who need to investigate food and notice uh, as i said computational gastronomy the name itself did not exist right. so we coined right. we coined it the 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 phrase was coined just to ensure that people understand what we are talking about in the first place otherwise we right. have to elaborate a lot about what this research is all about by telling okay uh, you know this is the research that we have done on food pairing 
these are the kind of investigations that we are doing all of this had to be bundled in a catchy phrase so computational gastronomy very aptly captures uh, the right. nuance right. of the topic yeah also, also it is kind of uh, otherwise it becomes a little bit dangerous because uh, i guess uh, uh, to to develop a community around the set of problems that would come under computational gastronomy you, you know that might start getting you know diluted and going into multiple different directions and everybody would call it in their own way right so i think to bring the community i think because i i guess ganesh that would be one of your aim as well down the line right to build the community of researchers right so so not just to develop your own research but to make sure that as a whole this this area keeps moving forward and more and more researchers in other universities and other institutes keep coming into the fold isn't that so in fact in fact this area is too big for one person or a single lab to work on it it's right. way too big in terms of what can be achieved uh, i i i call it transformation of food basically so uh, it's data driven uh, transformation of food that is what it can achieve essentially speaking it can make food computable in summary okay let's let's take an ex, uh, a question you know uh, just yeah. quickly uh, take some question let me see what are the questions that have come up uh, okay so there is a question from vidya uh, the question is uh, what is the use of, uh, of 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 using or the purpose of using cooking oil in indian food uh any physical analysis or you know in in when it comes to pairing of food and you know there is something of the there's the oil as well uh, you know which, which is also a, an important uh, aspect of the how the flavor profile develops right whether you are using mustard oil versus uh, sesame oil versus peanut oil versus normal veggie oil or versus even ghee or something like that or butter so any anything that you know which you guys found out ganesh or or whether you are working on this and like this sort of analysis oils the idea of oils or emulsions or something like that okay so um, to give a brief glimpse of what we have observed we have found out what ingredients and which category of ingredients are critical in making the recipes or making the uh, shape of the cuisine basically that's what we have observed uh oil yes we have figured out what kind of oils make a huge difference in the recipes that uh from different parts of the world including india we have looked at india as well this was not true when we did it in 2015 the account we had not accounted for different variations in the oil when we did this research we did not have that detail in the in with us but now we have accounted for those details um uh, and we don't do gastronomy uh, in terms of cooking the recipes on our own but what we do is to account for the data that goes into the recipes in terms of recipe name its ingredients its flavor molecules um, and other other nuances for example what kind of cooking process has been applied these are the kind of details that we apply and try to uh, mine the data to find patterns in them that's what we have done i will i will come to the uh... to this topic in more details you know as to like uh, the different dimensional dimensions in which you are exploring this this problem uh, uh and, and and so much so i want to tell people that uh i am actually uh i i i i feel i feel that i would have been a lot better chef than a computer scientist if i had pursued that direction but i was not that uh i would say adventurous as what ganesh was and that's why i didn't do it so i have no shame in admitting it now um now coming to the that part you know the difficulty and the challenge is ganesh i know uh whatever to whatever extent you can uh, tell us a little bit about that because people are going to be interested about because whenever you are kind of trying to get into a whole new direction and trying to establish that as a research area right i mean even for a, even in an established area if we are coming up with a new research question that itself is challenged a lot i mean that itself mm-hmm. is so difficult to establish in the community like yeah this is a worthwhile research question to call i mean even in a well established sub area or discipline 
right? Now you are essentially bringing out this whole new thing, so to say, you know, whole new sub-discipline, so to say. So what were the challenges, you know, and, and how would if somebody has to, uh, if not, a, if not a whole new discipline, but a whole new research question, which is quite, you know, possible that people might come up with a whole new research question. How should somebody go walk into that territory? Because, you know, you know, there are a lot of different types of challenges. I would love to know a little bit about the different categories of challenges and how you should be, how students or how researchers should be tackling that. Right. So I would address the question uh, by keeping in mind a PI to first uh, to begin with, not a PhD student. But let's say you, if you are a PI, uh, the strategy which worked very well with me was, I call it as a barbell strategy. This is inspired by uh, uh, an author called Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who has written books like The Black Swan and Anti-Fragile, uh, wherein, wherein you have, you do two different kinds of research. One is very stable, boring, may I call it boring, uh, routine research, which you will do, you will end up getting public, you know that you will get a publication or two, if you were to work on it for a year or, year or two, right? Uh, so that's not a big deal kind of a research, right? So very so it's more like, a, of, those research is more like a, just a matter of time and you will get the findings. Yeah, it's a matter of time. It's a, uh, it's a run of the mill, if you wish. That's the kind of a research. That's one end. It's like a typical, uh, uh, you know, gym barbell. On one side, you have that kind of a research, very stable and basic research. The second is the exploratory research. If you were to do only exploratory research, then probably you will burn out yourself as a PI, right? Because uh, not every research might turn out to be right. uh, uh, your, your lucky uh, day, right? It, 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 uh, it, it may not turn out to be the research that will give you a new domain or new discipline altogether. And please remember that I never started by imagining that I will start a new discipline or right. a new niche. This is only in retrospect, it has happened. It is a serendipitous event that it has happened. Probably if I were to carry out the barbell experiment of, okay, so I did this barbell experiment incidentally. I moved from a CSIR lab, a Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Lab in Himachal to IIT Jodhpur. And that is where I started working with conventional problems, which are run of the mill, straightforward, where I would be able to get a publication or two in a matter of a couple of years in any case. And at the same time, with undergraduate students and postgraduate students to uh, explore questions of weird nature, right? Uh, for example, uh, lung ventilation, mechanical lung ventilation was one problem. Okay. Uh, another uh, problem was uh, fMRI data analysis. Uh, the third problem was the food pairing analysis, right? Etc. So I kept on working on small, small problems. Many failed. I repeat, many failed. Uh, quite clearly, it doesn't work that way, right? Uh, this was a serendipitous thought which came in a classroom. If you were to ask me this question about where it all started, yeah. it started in a classroom. I was in a classroom and I had to provide the students with illustration of complex network. I was teaching a course on complex ne of complex network, and that's where. I uh, pulled out a paper based on one email that came from a friend. Okay. So a friend had out of chance had sent me an email. Today you have RAX, you know, RAX, uh, you know, to provide you, RAX can be your friend, which can make, allow you to make discoveries from the knowledge base that is already there. But it was happened to be a real friend of mine who had sent a paper out of his curiosity saying that uh, you work in networks, so this might be of interest to you. And that I looked at it and said, okay, let me take this paper as an illustration, as a demonstration to my students. And while working on it, while working on it, a uh -huh happened in my brain that, okay, something interesting boss, this is something which is unusual. I might uh, as well start investigating Indian cuisine, which was not done in that particular paper. In fact, I still have the answer scripts of, of my students. There were 42 or, or 43 odd students who were in my classroom to whom I had asked interesting questions about how do you design research problem if you were to investigate 
Indian cuisine and what kind of food pairing were to be measured, etc., etc. So, what started with a barbell experiment, as I told you, you know, exploratory uh, kind of an experiment, ended up becoming a new area altogether in a matter of six to seven years, and it was not an easy job because I lost job in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, because the area was so exploratory that and interdisciplinary that it was not valued, I was. Made fun of saying yeah, that, sure, that, that that's the point that I was trying to get at because yeah, know, it's so new and you, in, in some the territory is completely new and it's become so difficult to convince people that it, it it's actually has huge resource of opportunity out there. Yeah, it's it's challenging. Uh, you have to serve, you have to sustain through that phase. That's what I can say. If you believe that this problem is of interest. Then you have to sustain through that phase. I tr- I'll, t- I'll tell you, I and I, I personally love making presentations, uh, presenting my work to others to take their views. Okay, and later scoff off. Doesn't matter whatever their views are at at times, and at times take some critical input as well. I do that. So I called two of my friends, both one mathematician, uh, physicist, and another physicist, and I presented my initial research on food pairing. they laughed at me they said that what nonsense are you doing here right that's what they exactly in those words they mentioned it right what nonsense are you doing here you are doing some interesting work which is on in silico drug discovery that sounds yeah. so so sexy so interesting yeah. uh, you will obviously get funding for that research uh, and that seems something which is publishable that everybody will appreciate they will understand so what is this food pairing business that you are talking about right so they were absolutely in, unconvinced about it that was my own, my own friends and then there was a select there was a committee which was meant to evaluate my work which eventually kicked me out of my job from the iit that i was working in iit jodhpur yeah. well it happened but then i had to convince myself that what i'm doing is of value right so despite that happening in 2015 i had to keep i kept continued continued working on this topic uh, sustained i got a very beautiful advice from one of my senior mentors He said, "Ganesh, uh, this doesn't happen every day. What has happened with you in terms of losing a job because of doing some research, uh, you know, interesting or out of the way research, doesn't happen to everyone. But remember, either you can try to fight with those people in a legal manner or some other manner, directly talking to them, etc., or work on your thematic area that you have wanted to work that you that you started off with, right?" these are the two paths that you can take you can't do both right so decide what you want to do right now this was a i love him for giving this advice to me right and i took the second path i said i believe that this is a fantastic topic and a lot can be done in this area so i kept on working on that theme without worrying about my career remember you you need to many people advise you about how to build your career like a cv right so i left that exercise of cv building or career building in a conventional manner at that point of time without knowing what the consequences might be and this is where my adventurous streak again came handy uh, and i told my wife that you know what <laughs> this is the path i'm taking right uh, only one thing i can assure you that uh, i'll keep on feeding the family uh, there will be a job to i'll find some way of feeding the family don't worry about it but i i i have to do this job i have to change places if need be and keep on keep on working on this so your colleagues will uh, may not agree with you but you need to do the experiments and if you have a stable job unlike me then nothing stops you from doing those exploratory questions please keep working on those my small exploratory questions that's my suggestion so can we can we extend that suggestion to this thing that keep working on you know this weird project don't think of oh this is weird and what people will think and what people how people will react to it or criticize keep working on these small projects if not full time then at least part time and on the side project and then keep doing presentations keep presenting whatever you have to people who might criticize you but keep doing that i mean because I, presentation yeah. would be you know and as you keep developing the you on your idea keep presenting it and don't get don't be shy about it 
is that is that what you are trying to say like yeah so at least that has worked with me and this schema is not only for computational gastronomy research it has worked right. earlier earlier as well even for exploratory questions remember the protein structure modeling uh, work that i did in my phd was not a mainstream work in 2002 but i started working on it and i started working on it by talking to a protein chemistry group there is a there is a group of three labs called triangle group in ccmb used to be a uh, three researchers group so we used to have presentations so it worked there as well i made presentations i told them that this is what i intend to do i took critical feedback from them and i kept and kept on working on it and ended up getting a couple of very good publications out of the same research so coming back to what you said yes my advice is along those lines that never underestimate the power of a weird question right or weird sounding question right don't worry about it and coming back to uh, what do you care what other people think there is exactly a book by this name uh, you know by richard feynman uh, what do you care what other people think uh, i mean give a damn man you can't be an extraordinary uh, or out of the way researcher by caring to other people's will uh, and what what others think you can't be you can't be. you have to take your path on your uh, a different path altogether so people will scoff people will make fun of you right so you need to uh, right. find find ways of uh, keeping up with that okay so now coming back to uh, computational gastronomy a little bit i all, you know you talked about women liberty and how that is connected to uh, to this particular field uh, can you elaborate a little bit you know briefly on that part? so yeah so one is women's liberty and the second is in general this problem being an anthropological and societal question right so one of the interesting questions like i i have a uh, so always keep a good set of friends who can criticize you <laughs> very good friends who can criticize you close friends right and you shouldn't mind i mean obviously you wouldn't mind criticizing getting criticism from good friends so when i did this work and completed this uh, in analysis of complete uh, uh, food pairing in indian cuisine uh, the first ever criticism that i got uh, when i shared the paper was that how dare you call this indian cuisine right i mean what do you mean come on indian cuisine can't be a bunch of 2543 recipes right right indian cuisine is far more rich complex varied complex. diverse right so you can't be just picking this bunch of 2543 recipes from a website and call it a indian cuisine and that's a typical anthropological socio socio sciences view saying that ganesh you are you are making a mistake here in simplifying so a physicist in me uh, would say that hey man why need to understand that this is just a first step right but then uh, uh, you know that's that's the sociological point of view that has been accounted for that our recipes for example did not have too many non vegetarian recipes because sarla dalal's recipes primarily consider uh, are consist of vegetarian recipes right no, no, so but yes. uh, but uh, you need to account for the fact that uh, a lot of people out there do eat non vegetarian food uh, dalit recipes if you were to call it so uh, where are they account- accounting for those uh, most of the recipes no, north which eastern north is north east indian recipes now many of these uh, rarest re- recipes coming from northeast of in- northeast part of india right many of these recipes remember most of the recipes which are documented are documented because they are coming from elite communities right historically speaking many of the books that have earliest books that were written were written by people who were elite i by elite i mean by caste and community let's not forget the uh, fabric of society that's how the caste so fabric of society is weaved right so you need to account for that also so that was one part and coming back to the liberty of women so turns out uh, that cooking is a forte of women most of the time most of the time i repeat not always uh, while men do uh, cook many times but the fact of the matter remains that when it comes to the division of the labor uh, often times the division of the labor is done into cooking goes into the uh, Uh, into the basket of women right and they are left with the task of all the cooking that is to be done in the house without much of the help coming from the men in the house largely speaking mm-hmm. 
like washing machine can re- revolutionize the life of a woman and a family life in a same manner if cooking can be automated just think about it cooking can be cooking can be made exploratory cooking can be made fun yeah right just just imagine what revolution it can bring in terms of women's liberation right from cooking itself right of course anybody can cook men or women once it is liberated for everyone those who are interested would end up cooking exploring further but all of this if it if it can be done with the tool of computation data by playing with the data by analysis of the data and then plugging it with a machine for example already machines are being attempted which will try to simplify your cooking in a manner that you po- put pots pots into your machines and they will try to uh, try to make recipe uh, quote unquote your mother's recipe if you wish right your father's recipe whatever you like the most right uh, that will be uh, churned out from the machine so this is a revolution which is already happening and probably in the coming decade or two to come uh, i presume this is going to happen in a big way and that is where i am pointing to women's liberation and women's liber- liberty also in this so so ganesh can i say that if uh, if i am a foodie and at the same time i like i like i love data science and machine learning i should do computational gastronomy i would eminently advise you to do so if you are a food, I, in fact i keep getting a lot of requests from people who say that i am a foodie but i am not a data scientist tell me how do i do computational gastronomy how can i help you how can i work on computational gastronomy and these are people from institute of hotel management uh, right. and food 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 technology institutions i can imagine yeah yeah I, food I technology imagine. institutions so uh, personally speaking i would say that if you if you are interested in food as a topic and if you have any competency uh, along uh, aligned with data sciences you are obviously most uh, you know eligible candidate for doing computational gastronomy okay okay if i were not doing racks then i would have applied it in your lab <laughs> uh, yeah i i must tell you that even chefs want to come and work with us that's how great. things are that's how things great. are interesting yeah great so uh so uh, any any questions so far let me see if mean, there are some 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 questions over here any questions people that you want to ask ganesh ganesh is a extremely busy person it's very difficult to get him on most of the time so any questions just you know put it on the chat so ganesh uh, i have one question like you know when when it comes to exploring a new you know this is too big a thing like coming out with a and and much of that is serendipity as you said like a, a whole new area uh, but even a whole a new research problem when you are having and you want to explore that research question you want to investigate further and nobody has done that or very very few people have done that so what are those uh, initial steps i mean how should you be going about it like when you have nothing let's say when right from point zero let's say as a student so as a student right that's a good uh, because we did not touch upon that aspect much right but as a, as a student i believe what might help is in exploring because I, remember as a pi you are vulnerable because of your job right, right. but as a student you are not as vulnerable uh, you can explore topics right and you have all the time of for yourself as much as, as as i can see as a phd student right so in my opinion one should read a lot around the periphery of one's focus interest often times there would be a defined problem or at least a defined area which is offered to a phd research scholar or a student for that matter that he or she would be working on i would always advise them to look at the periphery uh, of interest right so whatever seems interesting reading random papers uh, and you know I, I, so incidentally it keeps coming to my mind but something like racks which can help you explore new topics uh, is something would, which would be amazing uh, which which can pop up new topics which you or which right. you can read up about right at least for me that's how that's how it works 
that's how it works uh, by reading uh, research articles uh, which n my phd supervisor also did not necessarily think about to begin with uh, i i read those articles and i got my very first idea of working on protein structure modeling so that is what i would advise and, and sometimes you see that if the question is question is very new then you wouldn't get that many number of papers per se on that specific research question but you know you might get a lot of papers on something which is complementary you know a, a research question which is complementary or relatable right so and you can get to see a lot of different how people are attacking those problems isn't that so in fact in fact uh you know what it's easy to work on a problem which is already hot uh and get a publication or two out of it right is absolutely easy. many people do that and at any given point of time research if you look at the history of science uh i mean even if you look at history not as old as few hundred years but less than 50 years old you will see that there are always hot topics which keep and keep coming and going right there was a certain point of time when ai came and went and it came again uh and, right so a point that i'm trying to make is this that uh if there is a new topic where there are less number of research articles which have come and if it excites you take that take that as a thematic question work on it explore that further because if you are able to make any dent in that particular question in that particular direction then that dent would carry a lot of value as time progresses right i'm to, i'm talking about your contribution and its value as time passes so will uh, will increase if you make if you are an early mover i mean literally right. it's an early for advantage so take right. that advantage i would say right we have we have two two questions one from leena uh uh leena uh, she is uh, asking this question like did you do any kind of analysis i don't know whether ganesh would be able to yes answer this question uh, what is the, you know in some some sort of a analysis of the life expectancy of certain kind of diet or certain kind of like you, the question specifically is vegan versus uh, meat eater let's say and uh mm -hmm. yeah i'll take it so no we haven't done we haven't done any analysis which gives us differences between vegan versus uh, you know others in terms of life expectancy unfortunately such epidemiological data is not easy to come by so we haven't been able to do any such analysis as such uh but we do have some analysis which gives us food and disease association we call it diet rx i'll type in the uh, type in the uh, website probably and you can <laughs> check that yeah, out yeah yeah sure sure yeah i will share so, it with people yeah surely so diet rx is the resource which we have created by mining close to 38000 research articles and this provides you uh, basically uh, uh, you know a provision for exploring research articles published research articles wherein an ingredient is associated either positively or negatively with one or the other disease that's all we have so we haven't any concluded anything about the goodness or badness of vegan or non vegetarian food as such so there is another question uh there is another question from leena but i guess this is not a not really a question that we should be discussing in this particular uh forum uh leena's question is uh, which is more acceptable vegan or meat eater i am i this is this is a very personal uh, you know thing but probably if the question relates to like what is more healthier or what is more healthy uh well i mean there are multiple different i mean again you know i i, I think ganesh already answered that question that you know that's yeah. sort of an analysis yeah we haven't done we haven't done any explicit analysis which can answer this question and there is no last word on it as such right uh, but right. but there are good reasons why people may want to explore vegetarian food and uh, vegetarian option for non vegetarian food you know for example the so called plant based meat which is coming up recently very heavily you know uh, is something which is uh, exciting uh, apart from lab based meat which is also right. coming up as a as a replacement for meat right so there right. are good eco ecological reasons why one might want right. to explore that 
although it's a personal choice as of now there is no final uh, answer from my side in terms of its goodness or not mm-hmm. shreyash has a question um uh, uh you know can is his question is can you tell us how does your research gastronomy affects our day to day life or the major impact of your research for a lay person like maybe by us you know who are not I got primarily it. yeah 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 i got it so i must tell you that computational gastronomy research as of now is where physics was in 18th century so it's very early times although times are going to fast you know move faster uh one of the early uh, one of the easiest way you can use our research is for example exploring databases such as diet rx which i mentioned to you about a uh, recipe db for example so in case you think uh, uh you would like to explore the flavor molecules and food pairing what kind of ingredients go well with each other if that is the kind of analysis that you would like to quickly do then you can use flavor db i am again typing it down into the chat box right you can use these resources uh, these are handy resources which are easily available for non academicians as well although some of those for example diet rx require you to have a little bit of understanding of uh, the a bit of diseases you need to understand a little bit more uh, to be able to use it meaningfully right but flavor db is very easy to use recipe db is very easy to, easy to use if you want to explore so that's where right now uh it is impacting your day to day life otherwise the most of the impact that we are creating is at a what can be called as a research to business level or research to industry uh, level that's where we are making an impact uh, through startup which uh, of which i am part of through industry okay. collaboration uh, to uh, and consultancies that i do that is where we are ma- we are making the impact and we wish to come to the space of culinary space as well as user space uh, you know where where the impact would be felt of computation gas right right so i have another question uh, i think uh, from uh, vidya and i guess this question kind of leads me to the to another question that i wanted to ask you dinesh uh, how to develop a hot topic for research work but i would pose this question this way that if we have to make this topic more popular you know what kind of stuff you are doing you know to build the community and to make the Make this area rather, you know, where people would ex- keep exploring. Any any plans or what kind of activities are you doing to make it, you know, right. so that yeah, yeah. So there are certain plans to make this research both accessible as well as popular among the lay audiences as well as experts equally. So one of them is the so-called the Turing test for the chefs, right? Mm-hmm. So now this might seem interesting to those who know what is a Turing test. Turing test is essentially a machine trying to fool a real human being, thinking that the machine is a real human being. I hope you got the point. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which is basically nothing but your Siri uh, or uh, you know Google Chat that you guys indulge into on a day-to-day basis, or uh, Alexa. Uh, you know, so it almost is trying to imitate a human being in a way that it's trying to make a meaningful conversation with you. and try to give answers to the questions that you are having right so well uh, uh, we are trying to create uh, rather we are trying to move in a direction where we can generate recipes in a computer first of all right which can fool wow. a chef okay so if a chef is fooled into thinking that this recipe which is actually computer generated but he or she if they think that this is real recipe then we have pass the first test the real test is of course the proof is in the pudding a real recipe would be like a recipe the, the chef would think that this is actually created by another chef okay. Okay. yeah another chef or it's a cultural recipe preheat okay. the oven uh, to 125 degrees celsius uh, take a bowl and add flour into it put add some water etc you know those instructions if the sound almost as if they are like a, from a real recipe uh, from a coming from other chef or a cultural uh, recipe you know traditional recipe if, if it sound if they feel or they think like that then we have achieved the first step the second step is actually cooking the recipe and tasting out the recipe but i'm keeping the second step a little a couple of years away the first test is what we are trying to work on and we hope to achieve it in a matter of anywhere between 12 to 18 months 
uh, wherein we we should be able to roll out this during test for chef so that's the first wow. thing yeah and that would be a really fun thing to do at a at a, at a last level in fact in fact uh, well the second thing is also on the similar lines to help people learn cooking what is the most because most people who don't know cooking like me who i am i have been only learning cooking recently unlike uh, saurish who has been experimenting with food and cooking for a long period of time uh, is is like where do i start you know i just can't start with a sophisticated recipe all of a sudden that would be a disaster for me and that would in fact break my confidence so is there a systematic way by which you can learn languages and similar to that okay, learn cooking yeah so the ideal way yes. yeah ideal way or the shortest path to uh, cooking in in a in a, in a certain cuisine people have come up with cheat sheets about how to learn french cheat sheet about how to learn spanish etc you know so that you can do at least casual conversation on a day to day basis when you move to such uh, when you go to a country right in a similar manner if you want to learn french cooking or spanish cooking or whatever mexican cooking or indian cooking for that matter what is the shortest step to going for going there and this to, with a analysis data analysis if you can churn out those that protocol then that is what we would like to make it popular uh by making it uh, you know creating a cheat sheet for learning cooking that's another thing these are only two uh, things that i will tell and keep other things for some other day yeah right right and uh, and to bring more researchers like researchers who will be working in computational gastronomy is there any any plan that you are doing like going across and you know one thing of course is you are doing a lot of uh, traveling pre covid and you were actually doing a lot of lectures and workshops and so on uh other ways in which is there any other systematic plan that you have at this as of now or is this is something that you would keep in, in, in the future no no uh, we are very serious about it i'm personally very keen on it and as you rightly said one of the ways we are doing it is uh, personally i am uh, i have visited at least 70 to 80 different places in the last 4 years Uh, in india and a couple of outside india where i have given talks and where i have presented computational gastronomy in an accessible manner that's the first thing that i have done the second thing is that we conduct a an annual symposium on computational gastronomy i'm not sure in december this year whether it will happen or not because of covid circumstances we'll try to do it online if possible uh, but every year in the second or third week of december saturday we conduct this symposium where we try to provide and these are available online on youtube by the way so you can explore the previous symposiums if you wish uh, to look at what has happened what kind of talks were given in the in the previous symposium the third thing is that uh, it's not only me but uh, the community is doing it international conference on data engineering has already started a workshop called decor the long form of it is little twisted but it is about recipe analysis essentially recipe data okay. analysis So ICT so, is one of the like the you know most established uh, conference conferences. Right? In fact, so it has started it, and we are a regular presenter there, and we are trying to build the community by being there on a regular basis and also contributing to uh, to uh, to ICT decor workshops on a yearly basis. The fourth thing is that we are making our data as much as possible. for academic purposes available remember that's one way because it is a data science right. one right. way we can contribute is to make the data available accessible so that people can use it so we are building apis which right. can be used right. yeah which can be used by the uh, community for analyzing analyzing our own data the flavor db data the recipe db data diet rx data we are trying to make them available as apis as much as possible so these are few ways by which we are trying to build uh, and take this uh, movement forward Great, great. So uh, it's it's getting uh, a little late for everyone, I guess, right now, and of course for Ganesh. And you know, it's uh, what we will do is we'll try to close this uh, session. If you have some more questions, maybe one or two questions, we can take very very quickly, or otherwise we will just wrap up today's session. Uh, I guess there's no. Let me see. I guess there's no other question that. we have not touched upon so thanks a lot ganesh for giving us the time and it was so so wonderful to reconnect with you 
especially in this sort of a platform where a lot of people would be very very uh, you know thankful to 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 the uh, to 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 the today's uh, the whatever experiences that you so candidly shared today with us my pleasure saurish and you know as i said it's it's always a pleasure to be talking to uh, uh, you know co researchers and anybody who is eager to know what has happened i don't consider myself uh, to be anybody who would be giving advices to people just like that but probably there are certain mistakes that i have done and there are certain right steps that i have taken and probably uh, one can learn out of those and that's what uh, i'm i'm trying to present in front of others yeah, so thank you for having me yeah that's what the, the the objective of this this forum is also you know in, so yeah so yeah thanks uh, so a uh, 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 very good night to all of you uh, guys and stay extremely safe and take very good care of your family and yourself right okay bye bye all right bye bye